This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, a podcast with a worldwide listenership that explores the broad world of preservation from every angle, from drones to mudlarking and everything in between. Now, let's get preserving. Roll your oak barrels over. We're making whiskey. On this week's Preserve Guest, join us in talking with Aaron Hollis, the co-executive director of West Overton Village Museum in Scottsdale, PA. Aaron will be sharing about reestablishing the whiskey distillery on the property after almost 100 years. The distillery is now operational and used to educate visitors about how whiskey was made nearly a century ago. All that and more on this week's Preserve Cast. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to Preserve Cast, and today we're excited to have uh, Aaron Hollis, the co-executive director of West Overton Village Museum in Scottsdale, Pennsylvania. Um, and we're going to be talking all about their work in interpreting history, but particularly reestablishing a whiskey distillery that was on the property um, after nearly 100 years. Um, but before we get there, we like to get to know people a little bit. So, Aaron, um, where'd you grow up um, and what led you into the, sort of this line of work? Sure. Well, first, Nick, thank you for having me on here. It's always a pleasure to talk about West Overton. Um, West Overton is in the town of Scottsdale, as you said, and I am also from the town of Scottsdale. I was born and raised here in this town with this museum in my backyard, and I have to be one of the few people in this field who are able to say that they have a great full-time museum job in their hometown, and I'm very glad to say that. So you grew up in Scottsdale, and, and for people listening across the country, maybe place it for us, kind of give us a geographic connection to where it is and what kind of size community it is, and then maybe we'll kind of figure out how you how you ended up working there and all that kind of stuff. But um, paint the picture of what Scottsdale is. So Scottsdale is a pretty small town of about 4,000 people, and it's located in southwestern Pennsylvania, about 40, 45 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. Scottsdale is right in the heart of what's called the Connellsville Cove region, which is an area of, of land between 1870 and 1920 that was producing about one third of the entire country's metallurgical Coke supply, which is used steel, not Coca-Cola. Because of that, there were a lot of Coke and coal operators, coal mine owners, bankers, other business people who made their homes in Scottsdale. So there was a lot of wealth in that town. And today, Quite a few of the streets are still lined with, you know, Victorian era um, mansions, a lot of Queen Anne, Second Empire, lots of architectural styles represented. And it was a very wealthy town before the Great Depression, much like much of this area. Once the Great Depression came around 1929 in the 30s, a lot of that has gone away. And so now the town is, I think, really trying to to figure out sort of what it is and and who it is. And we still have a, a decent industrial sector to this day, which is surprising for, for much of this area. So it's a, it's a small town. It ends up being a bedroom community for a lot of commuters to Pittsburgh. So today it still retains a lot of its charm that it developed during those industrial years. So um, tell us how you, I mean, obviously you got this great job working in your community. Did you go to school to do this kind of work? What was the, what was your path to actually then working in the museum? Yeah, I started here actually next year. It'll be 10 years that I've been here in some capacity. And I grew up driving by this museum and I came here for a field trip actually in junior high. And I was a sophomore or junior in undergrad. And I was a student at Pitt studying archaeology. And I was just driving by and I saw a sign out front that they were looking for volunteers. So I thought, well, I can work in the collection and maybe get some archival experience that's relevant to archaeology. So I started volunteering. That was in May of 2013. And then by the fall, some, some people had gone back to school, some things had changed, and I was able to come on as an employee basically a paid tour guide who was then responsible for sort of training some of the other tour guides. And that went on for a couple of years. Meanwhile, I finished my undergrad work, got that undergrad bachelor's degree in archaeology. And I came to this point in my life where I could either focus more solely on archaeology, I could continue this museum thing because I was really enjoying what was happening here, or this other opportunity had come up 
where after undergrad, I took a semester teaching English as a second language in Spain. And so that was also sort of on my mind as a potential path that I could take, one standing at that fork in the road. And um, things were looking good here at the museum. I was really enjoying it. So I um, applied to West Virginia University, their public history program, and I was accepted. And I was still sort of working here in West Overton, trying to double dip where I could to make my coursework projects relevant to the museum and um, get some real world applicable experience with that. And then as I finished graduate school, um, well, I did an internship over the summer in Savannah, Georgia. But when I finished grad school in, in 18, the museum was able to hire me on. So I started then as education director. And then this year, um, fortunately, we weathered the pandemic and we all kept our jobs. Um, my the executive director at the time resigned and and moved um somewhere else so uh, my colleague and i were both able to to share the role so that's sort of in a nutshell how i got from uh the volunteer who lived here in town to now being co-executive director of the museum it's an awesome story and i'm I'm curious before we get into the whiskey which is uh, what i'm sure a lot of people are here for uh <laughs> what um <laughs> What it, what is the museum? You know, like is it a house museum? Is it a collection of house museums? Is it what what if people came and visited and we encourage people to do it? What would they find? West Overton. This is kind of getting into the history of the site, but it started as a farm in the early 19th century. But by 1870, 1880, it had blossomed into an industrial community, and that community had grown around the rye whiskey distillery, and had grown around the the flour grist mill. And the farm, there was a coal mine here with 110 metallurgical coke ovens. Better off just looking that up and see how that process works. But there were 200 to 250 people who lived here in this town. And there were about 50 buildings. They had their own school, church, post office, general store. And all that rapidly declined with prohibition. And then, um, of course, the Great Depression was the nail in the coffin for the coal mining industry, kind of like I alluded to with Scottsdale. But today, this this village that was at the time its own independent town, we have some of that left. So we are a historical house museum. We have a historical house here. It was built 1838. But across the street from that, we have what was the original rye whiskey distillery slash grist mill built 1859. And we have in another building that was a stock barn for livestock, a small, new educational rye whiskey distillery. Another one of our buildings is said to be the largest standing brick barn in Pennsylvania. And that has been renovated into an event venue. And we have weddings there, especially in the spring and fall. And that's a great revenue stream for us. So we're a little bit of everything. The inside that distillery slash grist mill building today is a museum with an ex- with a, a, a big, beautiful exhibition. So the visitor experience here varies pretty widely. You know, we have the, the historical house tour, we have the museum exhibition, we have the distillery. So there's there's a lot going on and it's a it's a lot of different things, which is a wonderful um and exciting problem to have. Yeah, well, in 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 addition to all of that, you have a, a whiskey distillery. So, talk to us about the history of whiskey distilling, not only at West Overton, but in in the region, and then perhaps we can kind of jump into how you have rebooted this. Sure. So, this area for a long time has been known as sort of the the heart of the whiskey insurrection, or the whiskey rebellion, and you know that was a response to federal taxing of the production of of spirits following the American Revolution. And that that centers in like Washington County, which is west of us. But there was sort of this belief that after that rebellion had been crushed, the distilling craft here in western Pennsylvania moved south and distillers fled with tails between their legs to Kentucky and started making bourbon. And while there might be some some elements of that that are true, that misses out on the entire 19th and early 20th century history of whiskey in southwestern Pennsylvania. 
it originally was a, an, a way to supplement farming. So if farmers had rain left over at the end of the growing season, and probably more importantly, if they needed a way to preserve their grain or make it uh, more easy, easier to transport, whiskey was the answer. So by turning grain, which is very heavy and cumbersome, takes up a large volume, to make that easier to transport, you can distill it, make it liquid grain. And because of that, the way that whiskey was uh, used for medicinal purposes, it was used as an antiseptic, it just it became an, a, a strong part of the economy. People used the whiskey for trading, for bartering, and was, again, critical to the economy of this area. And that's even, that's in 1700s. But as as this area became less of a trade and barter economy, and there was more cash here, more stores here, more people here, people started to like it. They started to drink more of it, and they started to buy it. And so some people were at the right place and the right time, and they began to invest in their farm distilleries as a business. And one of those people was Abraham Overholt. He's sort of the the proprietor of West Overton and responsible for all of its growth. And he he begins distilling here, we say in the early 1800s, definitely by 1810, he's making whiskey. And he kind of says, you know, people really like my product. I want to make more money. I'm going to invest in this distillery, make more whiskey, sell it, and make more money. And so he... Begin, begins to focus less on his, his farm, but then instead use the farm to augment the distillery. And what happens is by the time of the Civil War, really, there are dozens and dozens of distilleries that dot southwestern Pennsylvania. And the majority of them are making a, a product that is affectionately known as Monongahela rye whiskey. And that's named for the Monongahela River that is fairly close to here. And when you hear Pittsburgh being the three rivers, the Monongahela is one of those three rivers. The Mon, the Allegheny, form, they meet together to form the Ohio. Those are the three rivers. So Monongahela rye whiskey, known for its proximity to the Monongahela and being in the Monongahela River watershed. And it becomes a um, known to have a mash bill of 80% rye grain and 20% malted barley. It was usually aged in, in steam heated warehouse, especially by the turn of the century, and was America's first whiskey before bourbon sort of took over in the 20th century. When we said American whiskey, everybody knew that to be rye, and the best rye, although folks in Maryland might disagree, came from Pennsylvania, especially southwestern Pennsylvania. So before the before prohibition, certainly before the turn of the century. Whiskey distilling was a bona fide industry in this area. And people, um, distillers shipped nationwide. They shipped around the world in some cases. And the largest rye whiskey distillery in the world in the 19th century was a, basically a stone's throw from here in what is today called Manesson, Pennsylvania. And that was the, the Gibsonton Mills distillery. So this was a big deal before... I was going to say, what what happens? It, it, prohibition just kills it all. Is that pretty much the the, the death knell for it? That is definitely the the the, uh, the death knell, the nail in the coffin for sure. However, following the Civil War, the early decade of the twentieth century, tastes are beginning to change, and, and people are drinking less rye, kind of moving toward bourbon, and prohibition really just ends whatever breath is left in this area's rye whiskey industry. And so you guys work to restart this. So walk us through the the thinking and what you had on site in order to be able to kind of get this distillery going. Um but but where does the where does the impetus for this come and and what what did you have at your disposal to get it started? Sure. So the reason we even started talking about this is because West Overton has a long tradition of whiskey distilling here. And Abraham Overholt began in the early 19th century. It culminated with the building we still have standing today. It's a five and a half story grist mill slash distillery built 1859 and production continued off and on until prohibition. So some in some circles, West Overton is considered one of the homes of 
American whiskey because Abraham Overholtz, one of those guys that took it from just a small farm operation to a real serious and profitable business. And I should mention that today, Old Overholt is owned and produced by Jim Beam in Kentucky. And that's a whole other long story. So the product that we make as I get into this is not Old Overholt. And you're not going to find this on liquor store shelves. So in 2014 or 15, we noticed that whiskey was making starting to make a comeback in Pennsylvania. If you've heard of um, a distillery called Wiggle in the Pittsburgh area, they were one of the first to sort of, they, they led the charge on this in some ways. And so it's sort of an opportunistic um, vision, but we said, you know, whiskey used to be made here. It's a huge part of this place's history, whether some folks like to acknowledge it or not. What if we started to make our own? And there was a lot of back and forth over what the scale of our operations should be, because we want to be a museum first. We want to be a historic site first and the distillery second, or maybe even third. So we had a lot of conversations and debates internally because some folks really saw the dollar signs of high volume, while others among us saw the vision being interpretation, education first to teach folks about the process, the science, and of course the history, which gives us a new entrance into all sorts of STEM areas, which was really exciting. And then the product is a nice byproduct of that process. So instead of using that giant building that is now a museum, we look to one of our small barns that we have here that had actually been renovated about 15 years prior to that. And it was used as an overflow event space. I mentioned that big barn. And it had restrooms and part of it was climate controlled. So it just seemed like good, a good canvas to build this distillery. And so we had the space, we had the building. What we had to do was, was find the money for the equipment, of course, find somebody who can make it and go through all the permits, the licenses, all of the red tape to get the thing offline while at the same time managing a museum and events and rentals business and um, all of the actual, the 19 historic structures that we have here, trying to keep all of that going while trying to get this distillery off the ground. Much of that was done by the previous director here, and we began distilling on site in 2020, which is just about exactly 100 years since Prohibition ended in distilling here. Well, that might be a good place to take a quick pause and then come back and, and find out how this has all worked out and what you've learned and how people can come and get some and all that good stuff. And um, we'll do that right here on PreserveCast. Historic preservation can't happen without skilled tradespeople to perform the work, and there's a critical need right now for those tradespeople. The Campaign for Historic Trades, powered by Preservation Maryland, is working to meet that need by strengthening apprenticeship opportunities within historic trades. In partnership with the National Park Service's Historic Preservation Training Center and Conservation Legacy, the campaign is currently recruiting for NPS Traditional Trades Apprenticeship Program, or TTAP. TTAP is an intensive 20-week apprenticeship that provides young adults the chance to learn historic trade skills while working on America's most iconic historic sites. Multiple positions are open for the 2022 season at national parks across the country. Visit historictrades.org for more information on TTAP and how to apply today. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast. We're excited to be talking with Aaron Hollis, um, who comes to us from the West Overton Historic Site in Scottsdale, PA. Uh, we've been talking about how they um, do their work there, um, what they uh, interpret, but not only that, how they have restarted this whiskey distilling effort. So, um, you know, we understand sort of the thought process behind it and um, how it's kind of come together. And you told us about where it happens. How do people interact with it and and how does how is it consumed? How is it sold? How has it changed the business of the historic site? So, like I said, we wanted this to be interpretation first, museum first, education first. So first I'll say, you know, you, you cannot find our product outside of our site for the most part. We want visitors to have people to have to come here to buy the product. So that way they're not just having a, a stale transaction of buying a bottle off a shelf. 
We want you to see the vision of why we're doing this. And along the way, we want you to learn something about our process. We want you to learn something about the history here. So we're still working the kinks of just how visitors interact with the distillery. And we are required to have regular open. People don't have to buy an admission to the museum to visit the distillery. If they visit during the distillery's posted open hours, they can walk in off the street and there's no barrier to entry there. So you can go in, you can sample the product, talk with our um, the person there serving. And most of our people who serve the whiskey are also our tour guides. So they're all pretty well versed in the history and the site and can not just sell you a bottle, but can sell you our story. So that is the bare minimum of how people can interact with it, where they can find our product, how they can buy it. Um, but we also leverage that distillery for special tours of um, behind the scenes, special tastings. And those happen sort of throughout the year or they can be booked for private groups. And some of that's accessible to our members as well. And how has it changed things? I mean, we don't have to get into the nitty gritty, but you are a nonprofit, so it's, we're not digging too deep. How has it changed the finances of the organization? Has it been a benefit? Has it sort of just been a wash? Has it like, you know, I think for, for groups around the country who are like, hmm, you know, we have an alcohol story on our site. Perhaps we could do this. What have, what have been the implications that way? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we're still, I think the dust is still settling here because, you know, this took five, six years to get off the ground. And we invest, we've invested a lot, a lot of money. And some of that has been funded through grants, but it still took a lot of money from our own, um, our own coffers to, to put that together. So yes, it does present a new stream of revenue because of the bottle sales, but also tourists who are interested in, may not be interested in touring a historical house, but they love the whiskey. So they're going to make the trip just for that. And maybe while they're here, they're going to see the house and the museum. And, you know, that that works all around for us. So at this point, to be honest, I don't know. It's, it's kind of a mixed bag um, at this point. But, you know, the I think when it, we get past the first couple of years, the barrels that we're serving now were just distilled in 2020. They take 18 months to age in a 30-gallon barrel. So we're just starting to recoup some of this investment. I think in the long run, it's going to be a great uh, boon to our business here and getting to meet new audiences with new revenue streams. But I think it's going to take several years before we are able to reap those benefits. And were you able to study other groups before you did this? Were there other examples out there that you were like, okay, you know, we know this group did it and it, it worked for them? Or are there, are there ones out there that you would point to that other people should be looking at? No. Um, we had the pleasure of working with some local distilleries who were traditional for profit businesses. And they coached us on production and reports and taxes and sort of things like that. But um, and we also spoke with the folks over at George Washington's Mount Vernon, which is a historic site that also operates a distillery. But this, the model that we have here is different. We have a modern, modern distillery. We're not using, his, this is not a historic trades program. So we didn't find really any nonprofits or museums to look to as a model, um, maybe somewhere out there I'm not aware of, but we we weren't able to to pick up the phone and call somebody for advice. I, and I feel like we were just kind of figuring it out as we went, um, to be honest. It's fascinating. And, and that's, I mean, just sort of trail breaking. And I, I think people listening all across the country should take note, should go and visit, should figure out how you guys did this, um, because I think that there's real interest in, in it. Um, I, this is very nitty gritty, but there's probably some nonprofit people curious if you're willing to answer. How does is it is it something that is it a part of the charitable mission or do you have to kind of do taxes separately on this? Did it did it create sort of confusion that way? It created a lot of confusion. OK, <laughs> that's what I, I think, figured. <laughs> but I was just curious. Yeah. And I think sometimes we're still confused. Uh, yeah. Um, my, my co-director and I, you know, we've been in this position for less than six months. So candidly, we've not had to really think about that until now. And so the, there is a, there's a separate EIN 
separate taxes. Okay. And I think of it, and this this is sort of generalizing. I think of it as like the nonprofit managing a for profit business. Sure, and that makes yeah. a lot more sense. I think, yeah, yeah. So, so it's almost a subsidiary of your work. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to think about it. And anytime you introduce distilled spirits into the conversation, that just takes the 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 red tape to a whole new level. In addition to the fact with the nonprofit managing the for profit and so forth. So yeah, the taxes, the legality, all of that has has been a mess. Uh, to be completely candid, um, so so yeah, that's that's something that we're still trying to wrap our heads around as we take over the the museum here. Well, it's funny is, you know, coming kind of coming full circle. Now, I guess you understand why there was a rebellion, right? I mean, (laughs) uh, (laughs) Um, so uh, so you're you're now on an American whiskey trail um, and, you know, so people can kind of come across Western PA and see all of this. What's next for you guys? Where where are you headed? I mean, this is a pretty bold and ambitious thing. Where are you guys headed next? And, um, you know, and, and, and we'll kind of work towards wrapping this conversation up from there. But, but where, where are you guys headed next? So in the distillery, uh, as I mentioned a couple of times, we have our big barn full a lot of events throughout the year. They're huge revenue stream for us. We're working on in the distillery, getting the loft above the distilling room and the tasting room open to be used as an event space. So people can rent the area above the distillery uh, for, for parties, cocktail parties, rehearsals, things like that. And that's going to require us to have an elevator and forms of egress, you know, all of those things. So we're hoping to get that online in the next 12 months or so. And we're actually in between distillers, our distiller, we worked with he he made a barrel with us he um went on to a different position so we're trying to find a new distiller and uh get them get them coached up and get them making product for us and get them doing some interp so if anybody's listening and 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 wants to distill they should get in touch with you yeah yeah uh, <laughs> sure, the issue sure. is we need to, when we say like hey we're looking for a distiller everybody comes out of the woodwork and says oh, i want to make whiskey cuz it's exciting and it's fun right but if you have experience, experience, and we're interested, an experienced it, distiller, yeah, yeah, and interesting, interested in working in a peculiar organizational structure, then um, yeah, reach out. Uh, from an interpretive standpoint, we just this year opened a new exhibition in our museum that is about how the industrial revolution impacted workers of this community and uh, how their how the everyday working class folks were affected next year we're hoping to open the floor above the current exhibition because this is in the five and a half story building and this this floor has been closed to the public for a number of years but we recently were gifted a collection of whiskey bottles from pennsylvania distilleries that is about 220 bottles or so so there's historic overhaul bottles but tons of other local distilleries so I'm hoping to renovate this second floor, have that collection in its entirety on display. I wouldn't normally display that many artifacts in one place, but whenever you see all of this collection in front of you, the scale is just massive and it's impressive and helps you appreciate how many distilleries there were in the products that they made. So we're hoping to get that open next year. And there are lots of other, other things on the floor we have planned, collection storage, um, a classroom. I'm thinking about trying to have an escape room. So that's another innovative thing that I have seen other museums do uh, as another another way to to teach people about our story here and get them thinking critically and all of that good stuff. So there's a, there's a lot of things going on here. Fantastic. Well, before we go, uh, we love to ask people make them squirm a little bit. Your favorite historic place or site, and we'll let, we'll exempt you and say it's it doesn't obviously it goes with the saying that. West Overton Village is, is it. But beyond that, do you have another favorite place? I do. So it's a pretty small site. And it's about 15 miles from where I am. It's uh, at the Penn State Fayette College campus. It's called the Colin Cook Heritage Center. And I don't know all of its institu- institutional history, but it was born out of 
kids and cl- students in class doing oral history interviews with people from this area who worked in the coal mining industry, who worked in the, the coke making industry and the steel industry. And so with those oral histories came artifacts and came all sorts of documents and things like that. And they, they built a small museum. And I, from, I'm, you know, I'm from this area. And so the, the coal mining industry of this area is, is uh, something that I, is very special to me and I really care about. And so whenever, whenever I go there, it's just this small museum, but I've jokingly called it like a sanctuary just because of how, you know, it does what museums should do. It makes me feel a certain way and I learn while I'm there and I like being there. And now one of my good friends recently became the archivist. So it's even better, but it's, it's uh, just this small museum in the basement of the library of the Penn State Fayette campus. And I, and I just love it. Well, that's a great place to end the conversation. A great uh, uh, recommendation for when people come up and visit you, the little side trip over there. Um, And looking forward to uh, myself coming up and and doing a tasting at some point. So thanks so much for joining us today, Aaron. This has been great. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to PreserveCast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening and keep on preserving.